Good evening, everybody. Welcome to this webinar. My name is Raphael Graf. I'm from Data Color itself. I'm here this evening with uh, Richard Curtis from Adobe and Richard West. They are going to talk to you about top tips with Adobe Lightroom and Photoshop tonight. Hello, Richard. How are you? Hi, Raf. Yeah, very good. Thank you. Yourself? Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Busy day, cool. but... Yeah, indeed, yeah. it has been for all of us. But I think Richard's probably having the busiest day of us all today. I think he's been on another uh, event all day, haven't you? So uh, I can hear him yeah. out there now. Uh, hi, Rich. Hi, Rich. Hi, yeah. So Raf wins the prize of not being called Richard on the webinar tonight. But um, <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> um, I, I think with that we'll say thank you to Raf, and uh, I'll, I'll now just give a little bit of a run through on um, what we're going to see tonight. So essentially, we've we've got a well, somewhere to approaching an hour's worth of content tonight. We're going to be uh, uh, letting Mr. Curtis do the majority of the talking this evening, um, and I'll be sitting back sipping a cocktail and uh, listening whilst he, he um, tells us all about the joys of Lightroom and Photoshop. And then I'll whistle in at the end with about 10 minutes of, uh, of information just to sort of fill out the, the evening as far as color management is concerned as well. But um, I think we're all looking forward to hearing uh, the, the latest and greatest from Adobe. So um, I think without further ado, we'll say, uh, Richard, if you are ready, kind sir, over to you, mate, if you want to share your screen. Right. Let I just can't share, my, I can't share my screen for some reason. If you could just enable me to do that, that would be fantastic. Yeah, hang on. Now you should be all set. Okay. I have perfectly. Okay, great. So... Uh, Hi everybody, welcome to this session. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to uh, speak to you tonight from uh, uh, what was a sunny Manchester. No, I'm joking, it's been throwing it down with rain on it. And so, so my name is Richard Curtis, I work for the Solutions Consultant. Where it means that um, each member in my team have to do status and mine happens to be digital imaging, so I have to look after. I get to look after Photoshop and, and Lightroom and Elements, um, but also Creative Cloud and the workflows around Creative Cloud. Um, what I want to talk about really today is just a, a couple of minutes on Creative Cloud, and also talk about the new photography bundle that we have going into the year. Now I'm going to go into uh, Lightroom. I'm going to cover in Lightroom a little bit on Lightroom Four, um, but I'm also going to cover um, Elements of Lightroom Five couple of workflow items in there and then we're going to go into some Photoshop and we're going to look at some new things in Photoshop CC. So I hope that's okay with everybody and we may as well, may as well start ahead. So Creative Cloud for Adobe is a, is a big launch into a subscription model and it's really it's exciting for us what, what we're doing. Um, Creative Cloud came out in 2012 with CS6 and in May this year we really pushed forward and um, put uh, Creative Cloud really as a, as a, as a forefront in technology. And you can see from the screen there, which you can hopefully see, that we've been adding features into Creative Cloud um, for a uh, for the whole year of two, two years now. There's been a lot of updates. And I think every week there's been an update to something into Creative Cloud. From a Lightroom and Photoshop point of view, we've obviously integrated Lightroom 5 into that suite, as well as Lightroom 5.2 and Lightroom 4. Now, what the Creative Cloud allows us to do is to um, give our customers and, and, and yourselves an opportunity to use brand new features as they come straight out of quality control and engineering. And um, in fact, two weeks ago, we had a, another release and we launched some new features inside um, Color Range and a few uh, other bits and pieces. So it's pretty exciting for us, but it also means that we can deliver more technology. Um, for us, Creative Cloud isn't just really about the applications, it's about the services that we can provide as, as part of that. Um, in December last year, we purchased a company called Behance, and um, Behance had a solution called ProSite. Now, Behance itself is free, and ProSite was a chargeable uh, subscription for a, on, on a yearly basis. But what we did was we rolled that into Creative Cloud, so every single Creative Cloud subscriber gets access to ProSite. And ProSite is a way to create a website from your content in, in Behance. So there's lots of exciting things going on, and there's a lot more to, to come. The most important thing, though, is really around the desktop application that you get as part of Creative Cloud. Um, you know, we obviously know that with inside application, you get um, you get to install two copies, one on a Windows machine or one on a Mac machine. And typically, when you buy a box, you get a Mac or a Windows machine. Well, that's all gone now with Creative Cloud. You can actually install on Windows or a Mac. 
Now, most people do take use of those two licenses and do sort of different machines. And one of the big bugbears inside um, a box probably that we couldn't really get a consistent sort between uh, two computers. But that's all gone away now as well. With the applications being synchronized to the internet and to Creative Cloud itself, we're now able to take settings out of Photoshop and out of the other applications, synchronize across the cloud and make both your um, machines that you're using or both your licenses that you're using both use the same settings, colors, fonts, actions, and this type of thing. You can keep them in tune with each other so your working environment is completely transparent. What we're hearing about in the in the uh, in the general ecosystem and around the world around creatives is that they actually want to be able to collaborate in different ways. <coughs> Collaboration really comes part of um, either sharing a sharing a folder, which is due soon in Creative Cloud, but also sharing assets with people, which you can do on the Creative Cloud itself. In fact, you can actually take files like a Dropbox scenario from your computer into the Creative Cloud, and that this application that you're seeing in front of you really does that. The collaboration piece, off on the creative point of view, is using Behance, so you can upload your content into Behance. You could share it in what's called a work in progress, which is like a temporary workspace to get feedback and critique of your peers and, and maybe a, a wider public if, if that's what you want to do and then you can ultimately publish your work to um, Behance and you can get that um, content out there and you can raise your profile obviously you know social applications and social networking is really kind of key in today's photography and creative community so having connectivity into things like LinkedIn and Pinterest and Facebook and Twitter is a really important aspect and that's all plugged into um, to the Behance, uh, Behance network like I say, we, 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 we purchased Behance in December, and out of that acquisition, we had about 1.2 million creators on the platform. That's growing ever since. We now have over a million uh, subscribers to the Creative Cloud, so that number has gone up um, hugely. There's actually a lot more photographers on the Creative Cloud now and using Behance. It's not just around photography, though, and the beauty of it, I think the beauty of it is that you've actually got creative professionals, like graphic designers on there as well, so you're going to really very high quality feedback and critique on your images that you put up there. Um, so it's not like a Flickr or a 500px where you just get random comments, you actually get proper constructive criticism. The personal portfolio is really the, the pro site part of this solution. You can put your content as a project into Behance and then very quickly customize your um, portfolio, which can be on a template basis, so it means you can get a website running in five minutes, host it all on Creative Cloud, so you don't need a hosting provider to do that. You do if you have your own domain name, I should, I should just add. But you can take your content from Behance and publish it straight into your pro site. So you have both sides. One to show your clients and your vendors and other pieces to get work. But the other side is, is more of a kind of work in progress kind of way to get your content out there. And then there's also a couple of offerings with Creative Cloud as well. Now, one of them, which I'm not really going to speak about much today, but that's the full Creative Cloud that gives you everything. Gives you an ability to create content using the InDesign. Um, to pull in your After Effects compositions and your animation and your video and, and your text and your photography coming together in InDesign and you can then create content for the um, for the iPad using the Adobe Digital Publishing Suite. Now you can target the iPad and you can make as many as you want through that process. You just need a developer ID and you can create as many as you want. That used to be a chargeable extra but now it's all bundled in as part of Creative Cloud and that's what we can do and that's the beauty of it is that you can enabled to do so many cool things with Creative Cloud. Okay, I'm just going to zip on a couple of slides and just want to talk about the photography bundle for Photoshop users. This is really cool uh, and it means that if you're a CS3 user or above, you can jump straight onto the Creative Cloud platform and take advantage of the new Photoshop for Creative Cloud as well as Lightroom, as well as the application that we, you get, which is a Creative Cloud application for 20 gig of storage, as well as commenting, reviewing, sharing, but also access to the Behance community, which I know is free, but you do get that as well. But also you get the pro site, which comes off there as well. And that is a really great, a great bundle. And, and not only do you get all the updates as well, so you don't have to wait for any updates anymore. You get them as they come out of engineering and quality control. But you can get all of that for £8.78 a month, including VAT in the UK. If you're from Europe, um, there are localised prices. Um, and if you're in the UK, you can go and do that from the website below. Now, I have a very, very small brain, so I'm just going to go to this slide here, just so you have a reference back to Adobe and back to me. So if you do need anything, you can go to my blog 
at blogs.over.com, Richard Curtis and Twitter. I get very excited in these presentations, so I forget to put this up when people ask, how can I get in contact with you? And this is exactly the way to do that. So that's just a whole new side there. Now, I'm sure you're pretty bored of the presentation, so let's go into Lightroom and look at the new features in Lightroom 4 and Lightroom 5. Let me just make this um, a bigger screen. So Lightroom 4 was a, a great release for Adobe and it really kind of really pushes what you can do with uh, Camera Raw uh, and, and take advantage of the speed and performance gains that you get with, with Lightroom as a, as a working professional photographer. Now one of the, the biggest enhancements we made was actually uh, in the development panel and I'm just going to demonstrate this on this, uh, on this image here. Um, now if you were using uh, a version before Lightroom 4 it would look something, so the development panel would look something like this. See the recovery the white and black. It's now shadow. And I look at this like fighting a tiger. Sometimes you're going to most of the time you're probably going to lose and you're not going to get very pretty out of it. So actually what we did was we split those two sliders away from each other and we can now focus on just the highlights, just the shadows. So you can see here now I have my highlights and my shadow slider. Now look at the histogram. The histogram itself has got lots of shadow detail and highlight detail but no mid-tone range. And if I actually turn on uh, shadow highlight clipping using the J key, you can see that the clipping in the shadows here. So actually I've got all that tone and I really want to get that out of the, of the image. So let's press the J key off again and I'm just going to dip the highlights down. And you can see there on the screen highlight information out. Now, Let's put the shadows. We can pull all that information out of the shadows and look at that. We've got lots of content there that we can pull out just using those two sliders, completely changing the way this picture looks. Now, you obviously want to set the white point and the black point. You can do that. Now, setting the white point and black point, you may know this already, but it tightens up the histogram a little bit and tightens up those, those levels. So if you press the Alt key, um, I don't have J turned on at the moment, so I don't want to see the clicking indicator on in the picture. If I press the Alt key, I can now move the whites and see where the white starts to clip and I can use the blacks and see where the blacks start to clip. Pretty cool so I get a visual indication back so it's very precise, very scientific. Now the last thing that we changed on the development module on this point is the clarity. Clarity could cause a little bit of haloing especially around the edges in Lightroom 3 below. But in Lightroom 4 we really pushed that up and the clarity now can be pushed right to the top and you get that lovely mid-tone contrast but you don't get any haloing. Now this isn't sharpening this is just adding mid-tone contrast so you get a beautiful look to your to your images and you can really work on them. So that was a really great thing in Lightroom in Lightroom 4. Now I'm going to show you something else in Lightroom 4 that is really neat. And I'm sure that a few people out there do HDR processing, but I'm sure a lot of people don't do HDR because it's really overdone. And this came out in Lightroom 4.4 and obviously comes through in Lightroom 5 as well. But let's just look at these three pictures and, and exactly examine what's going on here. You've got three pictures there, which are all 16-bit files, taken of tunnel view in Yosemite National Park. And you can see there that I, because of the light, I had to use a bracket exposure, one under, one over, stop. And um, what I'd like to do is blend them together. But obviously, I've got three 16-bit images. Now, typically, I would merge those together and create me another 16-bit image. But let's do some quick maths. 16-bit times 3 is 48. And then you try and put 48 into 16-bit. Yeah, something's going to break at some point, and that's why images look very contrasty because you're pushing all that information into a very small space. So a way around that, and a better way, is to use something called 32-bit processing. And 32-bit processing really came in with Lightroom 4.4, and it's really easy and super easy to do using Photoshop as an engine behind the scenes. So I have these three uh, selected, and I just press right-click. Now most people use Command E or Apple, or, sorry, Apple E or Control E to go to Photoshop. And that's a one-way trip to open one image, but if you if you open up the uh, fly out menu and look at edit in, you can see the so this means I'm going to use it, the HDR Pro engine in Photoshop. So let's just do this. This launches uh, Photoshop now. I have a couple of build machines on my machine. I'm never really sure which one's going to come up. So if you get a free splash screen, you didn't see it here. That's okay. Um, so it brings them in, so auto aligns them and auto collects the image onto each other. They will take them very quickly. So actually, they should line up nicely. And then what it will do is open up the HDR Pro interface for me inside Photoshop. And then we start working on the picture. So you can see here there's multiple modes. 
There's the 8-bit mode and the 16 mode. Let's just choose 16 mode for a second and talk about that. Well, you can see at the bottom you've got the three pictures and they're one stop under one stop over, as I mentioned before. In 16-bit mode, you have to compromise. At this point, you're pulling out shadow detail and highlight detail, and that's where you can kind of have that compression and get that really contrasted look. However, if you convert that to a 32-bit mode, you don't have any of those settings because you don't need them. You have all of the tonality there. So you've got all the highlights down to the shadow, all that information in those three pictures all put together and Photoshop and all that work for you. Now, obviously, if you're taking multiple exposures, you might have the trees, and you can see trees on the left-hand side. And, and when you've got wind, uh, and when you have wind in the air when you're taking these pictures, branches may move. Um, you may get a branch over multiple scenes, and it looks a bit blurry. So Photoshop can get rid of that by using Remove Ghosts. Clicking this guy on over here will get rid of any of that multiple uh, branches of them, uh, where a branch doesn't appear over multiple scenes, and it will get rid of it for you and clean that up. Now. You can complete this in Camera Raw, it's a new feature in CC, and that's, an, that's a very valid process, and it will take you into the Camera Raw engine, but actually I want to use Lightroom, so I'm going to press OK, and this will take it back into Photoshop. Now this is a real file, it's about 300 megabytes, it's not a demo asset, so it's a real file that I took with a, with a Fuji actually, a Fuji X Pro 1, and it creates me the file. The first thing I want to do, and don't worry about the screen, it's just the tone inside Photoshop, I'm going to press Command S and bring that straight back into Lightroom. Now you can see in Lightroom it's, it's got some activity and you can see here that we have an image and what happens is it brings it in now and supports full 32-bit TIFFs. So now I can go into my development module and I can pick up my highlight, pick up my shadow, set my white point and black point if I need to do just very quickly like I did before, quite easy, set those and then I'm just going to use clarity. Clarity is going to give me dimension, look at that. Now I can almost step through that mountain scene amazing so I can now do 32-bit processing without compromise HDR inside Lightroom and you get amazing amazing pictures out so there you go there's a quick quick workflow item that was introduced in Lightroom 4 and obviously available in Lightroom 5 okay let's look at some other pieces inside Lightroom uh, 5 now Lightroom 5 has got some great um, great new features um, and one of them is the advanced healing brush the advanced healing brush um, enables me to not only, let's have a look, not only just use the circular healing tool like that here, um, but also, you know, doing clone healing in Lightroom, you would click on this, uh, click on the image you want to remove, and Lightroom will go and sample it from somewhere else. You can also press the slash key to go sample the place, or you can drag this around to blend it in. Now notice, that um, the, there's a very hard edge around that patch. Now we have the feather. The feather tool allows me to blend that into the scene by creating a feather. Look at the tool now. You can see that little feather on the edge. So you can use feather and opacity to blend that in, which is really cool and actually enables me to work really fast inside Lightroom. Now, one of the other things I want to do is get rid of this person here, but obviously um, getting rid of the person requires a big round brush, or does it? No, it doesn't, because actually now in Lightroom 4, I can make a brush and I can paint to make my own shape. When I've made my own shape, notice here that the uh, the opacity is not full strength, therefore I see the girl and I can control her visibility through here. But look what's happening. The feather is taking effect and it's blending that into the scene, which means I can then just navigate this and I can blend my patch into the scene. Look at that, you can't see it anymore. So that's a really great, great way so I'm actually healing parts of the scene using the new feather on the clone heel and the advanced healing brush. Really, really quite nice. Really excited. Now, obviously, we're going to talk about color management later. So if you are working on your pictures, you really want to know what color manage all the way from the camera, all the way through to your screen, all the way through to your printer. And Rich is going to do a great job of that later on. Now, let's look at this tool. Oh, right. This is probably one of my favorite tools, actually, inside Lightroom 5. Now sometimes, and I know we all do it, we have pictures like this, which is a bit wonky. The horizon's out, the verticals are out. So let's go and fix that. There's a couple of things we can do. Now typically, before Lightroom 5, you'd probably go into CS6 and use something like uh, lens correction, or you'd use adaptive wide angle. And they're great, but it means you slow the workflow down very temporarily because you're just altering uh, and painting on the picture. So why not let Lightroom do it for us? It's a really nice way of doing it. 
Um, inside lens correction, we have the basic tab. Into the basic tab, we have um, the upright. Now, before I get into upright, I want to show you this this thing here. So, if you're using Canon glass or Nikon glass, Leica or Blad or other glass like Olympus, um, you want to use this uh, uh, little checkbox. This little checkbox enables me to really employ uh, the any lens deficiencies that are created by the lens. Lenses can have natural vignetting and natural pin cushioning in the picture, and you'll see that in a second when I, when I turn this on. Um, but we work with the camera manufacturers to really get the best out of the lenses, really work out that vignetting and, and pull that back. So if I turn this on now, you will see, you see what happened there? Look at that. You can see it fixes any barrel distortion, any lens correction, and sets that into the image. Now I can use this tool. Now, this tool isn't dependent upon that setting. It does help, obviously, because you're moving the pin cushioning, so you're making Lightroom work much easier. Let's press the level, and let's fix it to horizontal. Just a simple rotate. Vertical will then correct the vertical and the horizontal, and then it's going to turn it off for a second and show you auto. Auto will fix any pin cushioning at the same time, so mini warp. Now, sometimes you get something more aggressive and crazy. You get the horizons out, and you get an effect. You get converging verticals. It's really tricky, and you'll probably leave it alone and come back to it later. But actually, using full distortion correction will do a full 3D model. Now, you see there, it's going a little bit too far. So, I can fix that very quickly. I did forget to turn on profile corrections, which does help a little bit. But actually, user transform and manually transform this back to where it needs to be and get it exactly in the right place. So, that's a really nice little feature. And I've been using that for a lot more recently, um, especially for buildings and trees and this type of thing. Now, Look at this scene here. What's wrong with this scene? Well, it's very bright, and the story I want to tell is these cowboys' eyes get lost in that bright section. So I want to really dial that down. Now, I could use the post crop vignette. The post crop vignette would just dial the darkness on the edges and come out from the center, but I can't really control where that's coming in. And my eye still goes over here to this bright spot, so I can't. Um, I, I could, don't see the, the riders, I just see this white spot in the middle. So I want to get rid of that and really localize these, these riders here. So let's set that back to basics and go Shift Command R and reset that. Now, the new tool in Lightroom 5 is the radio filter. Bit of a rock star, really, here. It's got all the same attributes as the other tools have and the same with the basic panel, but it means I can draw in my adjustments like an ellipse and put the ellipse on here and dial down the oh, exposure. Look at that. And I can really focus on those cowboys. Now, the other thing I have seen, and it's really worthwhile looking at, is right clicking on these tools. You're now able to duplicate these tools, reset, and delete these from that fly out menu. So, this will, if you duplicate this, it will take that settings and it will get it somewhere else in the picture. You can then drag it out. So, really nice and easy just by doing that. Look at that. So, it's really nice and easy to duplicate those cowboys in the scene, and you're then you're good to go. Now, you probably noticed. But actually, if you're a Lightroom user already, you're probably seeing all these question marks, which means that I don't have anything plugged in. Um, so what this is telling me is that um, I'm missing those pictures. Now, in Lightroom 4 and before, if you try to work on those pictures in the development module, it would say you can't because they don't exist. But I've been working on these pictures, so how can that be? Well, let's just go and look over here. We've got something called Smart Preview. Smart Preview is telling me that I'm working on a very lossy version of this file. I've created the smart previews on import. I can also create them after as well at will. And I'll go over that in a second. Um, but the smart previews creates this really lossy file. Now imagine a scenario if you're a travel photographer, you're editing on the plane um, and you're working away and you've got your hard disk plugged in and the and and, and the uh, and the air hostess comes down the aisle, you're on the aisle seat, she comes down the aisle, hits your hard drive, and boom, you've lost your hard drive and she smashed the head into the drive, gone. If you now create a smart preview before you go on the plane, you can now work on that without having the drive connected, nice and safe, look after it. So how do you do that? Well, when you come into the import module, you have the build smart previews over here. And that will then bring that smart preview through and create it for you. If, for example, you um, want to create them manually, you can go into the library module previews and you can build smart preview or discard smart previews. So it's a real nice way of doing that. So I wouldn't build all of your is using the smart previews, just use a few, um, but you can do them quite effectively. Now, I don't have anything plugged in, so I can't show you that working, but when you do plug a drive in, 
these will come alive like they would do normally and this will be replaced by original plus smart preview. We've also made some modification to the slideshow um, which you can try as well using the trial of Lightroom 5 or using Crazy Cloud Trial. Um, we now include video as part of the uh, slideshow so you can play the images when it comes to the video it'll automatically play the video and then move on to the images next of the video. And then... This is a way to and telling you know what's going on and give it more context that's a really cool way of uh, doing that okay so that's a quick tour of Lightroom 5 really conscious of time so I'm just going to go into Photoshop and show you some cool things inside Photoshop that's new also in uh, in Creative Cloud now you've obviously just been through Camera Raw Camera Raw and Lightroom are exactly the same team and they are exactly the same technology so it works exactly the same way now what we have got though is something called Camera Raw as a filter. Now Camera Raw as a filter enables me to use all that Camera Raw technology on any layer inside Photoshop. So I'm just going to bring in this JPEG file and load it into Photoshop and you can see there that I have the background layer. Now I would like to uh, alter the white balance of this scene and I can do that by just going to an adjustment layer and doing selective colors and, and doing it manually by eye. But actually a better way of doing it is using the new camera raw filter. Now before I go into the camera raw filter let me talk about one thing. This is now going to be a one-way trip. If I click this filter here it will adjust the image and I can't go back and change it. Into smart filters. Smart filters enables my non-destructive working. So I turn this on, it asks me and tells me I'm going to, if I want to re-edit, click on the object and it will re-edit for you. Okay. That's now converted to a smart object. Let's have a look at what's happened. You can see here you've got the smart object. Now, let's go and put a filter on. Camera raw filter. Okay, so you see I brought in the camera raw now, and the white balance I can fix. Press auto, and I fix the white balance. Press OK, updates the raw filter, and now I can see that. I can turn that on and turn that off quite quickly. And I can also go back any point in time and fix that camera raw filter. Then I can do something else with it. But what I want to do is do something different. I press OK. And I might want to put an adjustment layer on here. So I'll mention adjustment layer. And I might want to do something around the vibrance and the saturation. So let's just do that quickly. Let's change the vibrance. OK, cool. Now what I want to do is I want to uh, do something else with a picture around this cloning and healing. Now what I'd normally do is, and talk with a lot of people, they would create a lock-off layer. They would say, OK, let's do... Uh, merge visible upwards, so shift, alt, command, e, and that will create me this lock-off layer. This lock-off layer is uh, is great for doing things on, but it means that I can't get to my other non-destructive layers. That's really annoying, and it's to increase the file size by double, which is kind of annoying. And if I make more changes on top of this layer, to get to my bottom changes, I have to go through it, so I can waste a lot of time doing that. Actually, a better way is to get rid of that layer completely. And wrap these in and you know you've got it, a smart object so pull it into a smart object it wraps it up and completely non-destructive edit and go back at any point in time and re-edit that now I can just go in and you can use my um, camera as a filter so it's a brand new workflow and now I can use my uh, clone heel tool I can also turn on visual spots and this will show me any issues in the picture it might show me the smarts and sensor smears that type of thing and I can fix my part of my scene and it will go and replace that. that yeah, that's all good. I'm happy with that. Now I have my picture. So don't forget, you have a mask on here as well. A mask is quite handy because it means I can return to the brush mode. I can paint with black, change the size, and I can paint things in and paint things out. See, I'm just painting back a little bit from that mask. Turning it on and turning it off. So that's a really great way of doing that uh, of doing that edit. So let me close that down. That's camera as a filter on a smart object. Smart objects are becoming more and more valuable in our non-destructive workflow. Let's open this image up here. I'm just going to open it up as a as a JPEG. And I want to open every smart object as well. So within camera raw I can press the shift key to turn this to the open it open object or I can open Photoshop smart objects from this panel here. So I'm just going to say open object and open that up and I want to work on the back. Now a brand new tool in CS6 was the content aware patch tool you can see over here it's in content aware mode. Now the adaption is very loose this is the amount of 
this is how much outside my selection I will be I'll be going. So let me just do that. Now the first thing people would normally do here is they wouldn't work on the background layer because that's going to make it obstructive. They would duplicate a layer. Not only have I just increased the far side by double, I'm also not able to see what adjustments I made in the future. So let's get rid of that guy. Let's go and create a transparent layer. This is going to be used as a mechanism to put all my patches on. So I'm only going to put data on here which I fix. I park on the transparent layer, select my tool, and basically just draw a little selection around that pack and move it into position. Now, as I move it into position, the pixels, and you can see them very quickly over here, will be transferred onto my transparent layer, which is brilliant. But it also means I can now use my adaption. The adaption is now saying, how do we recreate those pixels? So if I look at the selection, the very strict will stay just inside or just, just on the edge of that selection. So I get a very different content. If I then move this to very loose, it goes a bit far outside that selection and I get a different fill. It just means I've got much more control about what I'm trying to do. But let's just go over here and look at this image over here and turn off that layer. There's my patched information come through that transparent layer. Really nice. In three months time, if I work on this picture, I can press the eraser key, just get rid of all of this, look at that. And it's all gone. Really nice work, really nice, really nice, fast and efficient way of working with um, with edits. And this applies not only to that tool, but also applies to the Content Aware Move tool, the Sharpen tool, the Spot Healing tool. All of these use exactly the same thing. There was one tool that came out and was showed at Max a couple of years ago around um, ability to um, recreate a photograph that had been blurred. Now, look at this picture here. We can see we have sharp areas and we've got a blur area. Now, this tool isn't going to work on a blurred image. The image has to be sharp. But in this case, it was taken with possibly the wrong ISO and the shutter speed was too short for the focal length. Therefore, I got some camera movement. So it's called the um, shake reduction because it's going to reduce that shake. Now, I want to put this onto a smart object as well. So this new tool works on smart objects, which means I can paint in and paint out the effect. Sharpen, shake reduction. Now, what's going to happen here? It works really quickly and fixes the picture and it actually pulls it together and makes me a new a new image based upon those two images which is great now you're probably saying well that's great you know what about if you've got um a, a blurry picture like this but actually the camera moves left to right as well as up and down and, and moved around a little bit more well that's okay we can actually put multiple marks on the picture to go reconstruct different areas based upon the movement in those different areas this can also be used not just for shape reduction if you're using, say, Canon glass or Nikon glass and got a little bit of down to the alias filter in your pictures, i.e. losing over the texture, then try shape reduction. You might be able to get rid of a little bit of anti-aliasing and bring back some texture in the picture. So, again, a really, really nice way of uh, doing that. Now, I know a lot of you are probably using sharpening techniques as well to make your, make your photographs really stand out. So we've done some work on the smart sharpen. Let's just bring up this picture and let's just zoom in. Now, I'm going to bring up the... Smart Sharpen, again, this works on a smart object, so you can paint in and paint out with sharpness. But let's pick up the Smart Sharpen. Now, Smart Sharpen's got two modes. It's got what's called a legacy mode, and it's got the new mode. The legacy mode creates me this um, noise in some cases. Now, also notice the panel is really big, and I can change the size of the panel by just using this. But the noise is quite worrying, quite, you know, quite challenging to get rid of. I don't have any noise sliders. You see this one here is all hidden. And that's because I need to turn on the new algorithm. So I turn this on using Turn Off Legacy, and then I can immediately get rid of all that noise. Look at that, that cleans the image up, and then I can go into Reduce Noise, and I can pull that in if I need to pull that in. So a really great feature for sharpening your pictures, and don't forget, use it on a smart object as well. Now, it may be that you um, actually, let's close this down. It may be that you want to upsize your pictures. Now, upsize has always been a bit tricky. People say, well, the best way to upsize is by multiply it by 50% each time on the resize, it's better for the image well. Um, and some people say don't use Photoshop at all, they they, they say use um, they, you know, another another product like Genuine Practice or something. I mean you can do that and that's fine. But we've got some great technology now in Photoshop CC. If I go to image size, look at this picture, it's tiny, 750 by 499, it's one meg. Okay, so let's just uh, change the size of this panel so I can change that as well and get a, a real good picture of what I'm doing here. Now, when I'm resizing, I'm probably going to use either by keep it smoother for enlarging or by keep it sharper for reduction. But actually, I've got a new one called Preserve Detail. I'll use that in a second. 
Let me just increase the size of this by, say, 350%. And then I'm just going to reposition on the screen and zoom into this cross. Now you can see there, it's done a pretty good job. So let's just turn that, um, let's just uh, turn that to five cubic smoother, which is the original. And that's how we're going to uh, enlarge. So you can see there, we're just doing the enlargement using that um, old technique. Now the new technique, once I turn it on, is the preserve details. If I click this, look at that. You can see how much sharper it is now. We're just looking at the edges and protecting the edges, and we are we are upsampling everything around it. Look at that, we've got reduced noise as well. So if I am incurring noise, I can turn that noise down. So I'm not having that in my picture. Really great, great technology. So something else to have a play around with inside Photoshop CC. Now, the last one I would like to show you really is something that came out only a, about a week or so ago, which is great. And this is this um, color range enhancement. Let me just open this, open this picture up here. Now, this was taken a few weeks ago by myself in Norway and you can see it's got lots of trees if I go in here I want to look at the trees and there's loads of them but what I'd like to do is add some micro contrast and some lenses can give you this micro contrast effect where they look at all these little shadow details and they're going to boost the black now I could paint that in but it's going to take me a while to paint all that in and I really don't have the time to do that especially now when we've got five minutes to go you know painting all those in but also you know to make it even more complex want to paint in all those reflections as well and Cover all this area here and do it in a way that I get really nice precise control. So it's a bit tricky, but we've got a new uh, selection on the color range. Color range now has on the highlights and midtones and shadows a way that you can pull in the range. So let me just take this all off and just change my selection preview to a quick mask. And I'm going to invert that so I can see the mask as it builds. My range, think of it as a step wedge. I'm going to cover my shadow area first. I'm going to pull the shadows in. And I may want to cover 10, 10 out of 255 for the shadows, but it's not picking anything up. So I'm going to increase that a bit more. And you can see as I do, I start to increase the tonal range. And you see there, the mask is now building. I'm now seeing selection inside the top of the mountain. But wait, I want to be able to look at the trees as well. So I'm going to feather in the trees because they're very similar black. Let's feather that in using the fuzzy. You can see it building the mask. Look at that. Builds all the mask. It builds this area and this area and pulls all this out as well. Which is brilliant. Now, take off the mask and invert it. Okay. So now it's going to leave me with the with this. So black's going to conceal white to reveal. You know that classic. Press OK. It creates me selection. Now I want to put black in that in the trees. So layer adjustment layer. I'm going to use selected color. Now in here, I'm just going to go to my blacks. I'm going to put black and watch this. You see the contrast start to boost just in the areas of the trees and the reflections of the trees. All the mountains has been, have been covered all within about 1 minute 30 seconds. And I've got a very precise mask. Let's look at the mask while we're in there so you can see what I'm talking about. So look at that. Look at the precision of the mask. It's amazing. Something I wouldn't be able to do without that tool and get that precise mask creation. So there you go. That's a few things inside inside the new Photoshop CC. We, we mentioned before we've got um, the, uh, the, the login and synchronize settings. You actually log in now to the applications and you get to synchronize all your content here, which is really great. So that's giving you an overview of Creative Cloud, giving you an overview of the photographer's bundle. Let me bring you my slides up again so you can just see that final slide. We've gone through the Creative Cloud, the Photographer's Bundle, and, and it's really good value. So before the end of the year, have a look at that and, and think about that if you want to do that. We've also gone through Lightroom 4. We've gone through um, all the new features in Lightroom 4 and also Lightroom 5 as well. Let me cover very quickly the um, the panoramic, the, so the HDR from Lightroom to, uh, to Photoshop. We looked at smart objects. Smart objects can also go from Lightroom to Photoshop. And we've got all the new features in CC as well. So You've got some CC features there and some CS Fix features there. So we're very excited about what we have inside Photoshop now and Lightroom and the workflow between the two. It's, it's amazing and it enables you hopefully to make amazing, amazing quality pictures. So um, what I'd like to do though is to bring Richard back over and talk to you about the data side of things. Obviously um, having um, 
proper color management is is really important to a very successful and amazing amazing images so let me just bring uh, bring rich oh no i'm already there actually rich so thank you kindly mate that was uh, excellent as ever and uh, as ever i find myself thinking I must just get you to go through that again with me so um you know, amazing how much you can cram into a very small amount of time so thank you for that um we'll be uh, sort of covering off where this fits into the joys of color management now as well because uh, we we have um, uh, obviously seen some fantastic retouching done there by Richard but the the key thing to bear in mind is that when you're retouching your images if you can't actually see correctly on screen what you're doing then there is very little point in retouching it because you could be making things a lot worse rather than better so let's kick off first of all with having a look at something that's really um, well, all of our tools are made to work hand in hand with Adobe's software tools but in particular we've got something that solves one of those um, perennial photographers issues here and that's uh, using the joys of uh, some sort of target for your photography work so let's uh, let's think about set the scene basically um, we're really focused on this this color chart that you can see on the screen here this is the spider checker and this is a, a, a fantastic tool for solving this little conundrum I take a whole bunch of photographs and some of those photographs are taken for instance inside some of them are taken outside and some of them are taken in a perhaps a different lighting condition as well and you know that every subject every object that's the same in all those different uh, color settings is the same color you know in this instance the bride hasn't got slightly more tanned or slightly more jaundiced in between the the wedding and the uh, the reception well hopefully not anyway um, and therefore you know they should be the same well what we want to be able to do is have something to aim for that means that you can give consistency you can bring the same lighting conditions a target to aim for that gives the same lighting conditions across all of those and that's where if we pop into the joys of uh, Lightroom and show you uh, what we're talking about here this is um, some shoots we're doing last year in the, the Olympics now let's say I had taken multiple different uh, shots in different lighting conditions during the day what I want to be able to do is shoot my color chart shoot my spider check at some point in each of those lighting conditions key thing here is that basically the uh, the lighting conditions um, are not going to, you know if they're majorly changing then you need to shoot this uh, this target in each one of those and the good thing about the target is that it is big enough to hit from a distance because there are this sort of a smaller pocketable version of this which really isn't that much use because you can't actually hit it from a, a decent distance away but what we're doing here is we're saying okay now I brought something that I know all of those color values into my workflow and I've done that in each of those different lighting conditions and so once I've done that I can say okay let's actually go in here let's take it into the develop module for instance within Lightroom let's set up our, our white balance first of all by choosing this square here square E2 if, if you can see the actual guides on there but uh, instantly see there a, a pop hopefully even across the joys of the internet you see a, a pop in the difference of that uh, that color that white balance being set there and then we just need to go into reading our our color values here just under the histogram you're going to see that uh, okay what we want to be aiming for is somewhere in here around the uh, somewhere around the 96 percent actually so we're just going to increase that exposure just a little bit to bring that up to to pop that into maybe a little bit higher a little bit higher so we pop that up into at the 96 could you be, be using the J key here and uh, in the fashion that uh, Richard was showing earlier on we also want to pop down here and want to be reading our um, uh, black levels as well so that needs to be somewhere down in the uh, the four percent so we just pop into our black slide here just to to actually raise that up a little bit as well so just going to pop that onto somewhere around oops, uh, around four percent there so getting somewhere in the right direction a little bit a uh, little bit too light so let's take that down a little bit and somewhere around there we, we'll say that's good enough we, we won't waste your time watching the slide sliders but effectively at that point this chart comes with a plugin for the joys of our lovely Lightroom software. So if I pop it into the Spider Checker app, what we're doing here is we're actually opening up this color chart into a known environment. Now, actually, this is very useful even if you happen to be colorblind because it doesn't actually uh, don't actually need to um, be able to tell what these colors are at this particular juncture. What we're doing effectively is we're giving a known selection of 50 odd colors here for your Lightroom 
and therefore your camera to use as a reference guide. So therefore, we can just resize this if we need to. We, we've got the opportunity to do that. We're just going to make sure they're popped on the, the actual squares. The, the patches are there to read. Those are the actual patches in the software. We're just going to overlay those on the patches within the spider checker. As soon as we've done that, we've then got the opportunity, for instance, to choose a, perhaps a bias for our photography as well. This was quite a bright day, taking some, some bright uh, very high pigmented colors so maybe we'll, we want to create a more saturated profile because what we're doing here is we're not only using the 50 plus squares as a reference we're also giving it a, a characteristic curve for that color there so if I just choose saturation there I can then save this to multiple different environments I could be using this in camera raw, Adobe Camera Raw, or as we are here in Lightroom so if I just save that and then give it a name or we'll call that RM um, test. Oops, if only I could type test one and click on OK. Now that would actually save it into uh, save the actual um, Lightroom profile. I have to say, you do have to quit Lightroom here, a little bit of a nuance with uh, saving presets here in order to get those presets applied into Lightroom. I won't do that now, just, just to give you uh, the joys of seeing one extra pro, uh, profile preset being applied here. But what we can do is just show how, okay, we can be using the, the same lighting conditions here, use a, use a particular preset to give that, uh, that just that little bump. Now you perhaps not going to see a great deal over the choice of the internet but I can assure you from my end of things uh, where I'm choosing a more neutral preset there for instance that is flattening that out and you can see how that hasn't changed the, the lighting conditions compared to that more saturated lighting condition there so therefore you can see how this can be applied and the key thing here is the joys of Lightroom you can actually choose all of your images and therefore apply that same preset to all of them straight away so each of those instantly they get that little bump and effectively your colors are automatically aligned and linearized across the whole of the run there and of course if you've taken the same shot of the same target in different lighting conditions or the same subjects then if you apply the relevant um, uh, the relevant uh, preset produced from that shot in the right lighting condition across those other lighting condition shots, you're going to get it linearized, so all the same colors would be the same across all of these. So as I say, great way in which we, we work together with uh, the joys of uh, the, uh, the Adobe suite of softwares here. Um, we also have different tools like, for instance, our Spider Cube, another great tool. The difference here, this is sort of a 3D version, if you like, of the, the same tool that um, uh, we've, we've shown you there, or part of the same tool in the uh, the spider checker. What it gives you is again the opportunity to set your white balance. Basically, I mean here we're we're in the joys of uh, camera raw, for instance. So we can go in here and we can actually be uh, setting our white balance using the tool here. Just click on whichever is the lighter side of our target here, basically, in order to apply the white white balance. And you may be thinking, is it hexagonal or is it 3D and cubic? It is in fact a cubic shaped cube here, hence the name you may have guessed, who knew. Uh, but basically it gives you the opportunity to shoot this and therefore be able to click up on, on your pick up on your white patch. Not a great deal of difference there as we said in the, in this particular scenario. But again rather like Lightroom and um, uh, and Photoshop you can actually get, turn on your outer gamut areas here so therefore we can actually see if we've, uh, we've actually been able to um, pull in any areas that are um, just clipping basically that that hole in the bottom of the uh, the square there, if you couldn't see that before, the, the actual bottom uh, area of the square is about 4% black again. Within that hole is intended to be your black catch light. And likewise, the ball at the top here, that's intended to be your 100% scintillation point, whereas the whites here are around 4% again. So as long as you choose to set your white balance using the lighter side of that cube, then again, you're able to set your white balance across the, the whole uh, range of your shots because you can save again this is a as a um, a particular uh, shortcut you can set this as essentially as a preset so apply this as a preset within or save this as a preset and then apply it later on if you so desire to multiple images key thing with this is the fact that uh, the actual cube is about I don't know a two inch square cube so therefore this is something easily secretable around your person you can whip it out if you haven't got the opportunity to take your your spider checker card with you to set that full-blown range of, of 
spot colors and, and basically get your tonality across and, and color calibration across the whole of your color range there so you, you know you've got your, your shoot guide for the whole of your color range. Here with the, the cube you've actually got something that at least can set that, that, uh, that gray balance across the whole uh, range of your images. So top tip if you do get one of these, fantastic little tool. Um, they are pigmented all the way through, so if it, even if it gets scratched, it's still going to have that same 18%. The, the gray here is 18%, 18% gray at the top there, and 4% and 4% on the other two uh, color areas there. It'll go all the way through because it's pigmented all the way through. But top tip, put it into its little bag that it comes with if you put it into your pockets because if you happen to wash your clothes, I do occasionally, uh, then basically it gives you the opportunity to bleach anything because detergents that you wash clothes in have a little bit of a whitening agent in there so if you happen to put your cube into your pocket without its little cover it will in time bleach and therefore lose the, the benefits of having that, that known area, known colors to, to shoot for. So, so there's a couple of things that are actually specifically aimed at working in the joys of, uh, of uh, the Adobe workflow there. And of course one of the, the other things that is imperative really when you're working uh, in today's modern workflows is actually to have something to aim for when you're soft proofing because as we all know if we print out our images on different types of stocks through different printers and with different inks and potentially on different batches of inks then you're going to see a difference so therefore another key tool that you should all be aware of is the joys of uh, data color spider print now this is a tool that allows you to print out on the relevant stock and ink, uh, the the test charts that come with the so with the the hardware with the spider print, um, you've got a whole different range of uh, test charts depending on what sort of level of uh, quality, quality and uh, management you need. But the key thing it allows you to do is to create what we call a profile. Now profiles are um, delightful little uh, features that um, very very small amount of information, a bit like um, Lightroom and uh, the adjustments in smart filters within Photoshop. It's, a, it's essentially a metadata adjustment or it's a little bit of tagged information really. And it gives you a, a, you know, a few kilobytes of information that allows you to adjust the colors. So what it means is provided you've run your test charts uh, on the relevant paper or for instance if you're using somebody else to do it that they either print out the chart and give it back to you so you can actually profile it or they provide a profile for you. But if at some point you get the opportunity to actually get that profile and drop it into your computer, then you can turn on this little button down here in soft proofing. And that gives us the opportunity to actually emulate what your end result is going to be. So if, for instance, you know that you're going to be shooting on or printing out on a particularly um, low quality printer, then you can go in and have that little profile ready and instantly be able to see exactly how that's going to work. Now here I've chosen something that is low quality because it's not really aimed at a, as a, um, a quality photographic printer here. This is just a small printer I have at home for, for letters and so on. But the important thing is you can instantly see the soft proofing on or off here. And of course that is your instant um, warning to say okay crikey if I print out on this printer with this conditions here, this stock and this, this paper, it's going to look lousy. So then I can go into the develop module, I can boost it and bump it. But probably one of the key things you do want to do also is to have something along the lines of uh, the color sync utility here. Now this is uh, built into the Mac OS, so if you uh, go into the color sync utility, just pop that open, it's in your applications folder under utilities. This also allows you to see all the different profiles you may have on your computer on the Mac. Now, there's something similar called Color on the Windows platform. Uh, now, here on the Mac, I can instantly go in here and I can say, okay, let's have a look at uh, my, for instance, my Adobe RGB color space. You see that uh, very large, lovely color space there, which if you have things like an ISO or an NEC display, you'll be able to see uh, the majority of that color space. So great to uh, be working on those those machines. Uh, unfortunately I've got my lovely uh, Mac based laptop here um, and I've been working my way through uh, profiling it on a regular basis and this is actually the color space I've got from my screen here so you'll see that as far as retouching in RGB is concerned, Adobe RGB is concerned, I'm going to have um, not a lot that I'll be able to see out of my 
Adobe RGB Spectrum, and, and actually, unfortunately, my screen is is actually degenerating over time. It's actually decreasing in its color abilities as as time moves on. So therefore, uh, not particularly happy in what's happening to my screen at all. But the good thing for you guys is, a, you can be checking what's going on with your own screens, but b, you can go in here and check what those output profiles are like. So for instance, if I know I'm going to be printing or sending my images to print out on a um, perhaps a newspaper press, I can see here I can apply a newspaper profile to that. So I can get these generic profiles from the web or I can perhaps get a specific profile for my particular conditions for whatever press or printer it is. And just drop that into my profile, uh, color sync profile uh, viewer here, the, uh, the color sync utility. And you can see here, this this image is going to be absolutely filled in down in the black area because, like most newspaper presses, this is actually soaking up ink and therefore you're getting a whole bunch of uh, darker uh, end result than you would really want with your images. And of course, the key thing here is you can actually go in and, and uh, proof ahead of this uh, game as well. So you can actually either use the, the joys of your, your uh, soft proofing solution in uh, in Lightroom there, or likewise in uh, in Photoshop, or you can say, okay, let's actually go and uh, just drop it onto our color sync utility. If you don't happen to have either of those on the machine you're doing any work on, and within here you can then actually be going in and, and do that soft proofing. The downside with this, though, is much as this gives you a, an instant and obvious means of uh, of actually seeing whether I'm um, um, what my my end result is going to be. I, unfortunately, the one thing it isn't going to allow me to do is adjust for that. So therefore, far better to be doing this in, for instance, uh, either Lightroom or Photoshop, as discussed, because that really gives you far more opportunity to uh, to soft proof and see that end result. So if I just perhaps show you a more abstract end result, here, you can see that uh, this is uh, actually soft proofing away for us with whatever whatever type of profile we drop on there. But um, so that's that's pretty much wrapped us up for the night. The key thing though, whether you do get the opportunity to soft proof or whether you don't, the one thing that you do need to do folks when you're doing some fantastic retouching like the stuff that you've seen from Richard earlier on in Lightroom and in Photoshop, you need to be doing this on a screen that you know is color matched. In order to do that, screen calibration is that key thing you need to get right, whether you have <laughs> Uh, any interest in proofing out and uh, and running profiles for your output proofers or whether you're happy to just use some standard off-the-shelf profiles for that, there's no point in doing any of that soft proofing and retouching because you're in this environment where you have so many different types of screens. If you haven't put them into a uniform environment, you really can't trust what you're seeing. And also, as with my own screen where I was showing you there, it ages over time. Things change over time, no matter how good the the display or the piece of kit is. So, th therefore, top tip for the night from from me: get a spider. It's a very very uh, useful little device. Just as you see here, you pop it onto your screen, plug it into your USB port of your computer, run the software that comes with it. It runs a whole bunch of uh, color swatches in front of the eye of the device, and very similar to the way we were showing you the, the spider checker working with Lightroom there. What it's doing here for your screen is it's showing a selection of colors that the software that comes with the spider knows what they should look like and the spider is reading that and saying, okay, great. This is the amount this screen is out from the true ICC standard. So therefore, we'll apply this profile at the end of the process. It's some very simple software, just runs you through about four or five steps. At the end of having run these software swatches, it says, do you want to save this profile in and use it on your machine? Just give it a name, give it a date, so you can actually trace it later on to see how things are changing over time, and hit save, and that's it. It automatically applies it. So there's our whistle-stop tour of uh, color management, folks. We've kept it short on that side of things tonight to make sure that you have as much information as possible from Richard. I will just um, say, if you do want to find out more, we're obviously running these webinars all the time, so please look, uh, check out our uh, our times for next, when next we're going to be running the, the webinars. Um, we do have our own little ebook you can uh, download. It's free. There's the English version available um, on the URL there, so please pop onto the, the data color site and uh, download that. It gives you tips and tricks across the whole range there. So we've uh, speedily rushed through things tonight, but that will give you 
some chance to uh, peruse that at your leisure. Also, a whole bunch of tutorials on YouTube. So uh, again, another opportunity for you to uh, catch up on how to work things. For instance, uh, the the cube and the check it, and get that in more detail there. Uh, and likewise, come and interact with us. Give us your your feedback on the blogs. And lastly, our delightful team of um, uh, of techies uh, ever at your your call there. Um, there, uh, basically, you can get them through the the phone number there or the the support. Uh, support area on the website so just uh, if you do need help if you need advice tips and tricks uh, drop them a line and uh, we'll all be happy to uh, talk to you and the guys will be happy to talk to you so with that folks it has been a, a swift hour um, but hopefully it's been rewarding and informative for you um, I think at this point we're gonna perhaps uh, ask Rich to open back up on his microphone if he is indeed muted out, I'm not sure what he is and open her up for questions so perhaps um, uh, if you do have questions from the floor I, I would say folks that um, we're going to be cutting off fairly quickly tonight because Richard has had a long day of uh, Richard Curtis, not not this Richard, has had a long day of uh, events already today. So therefore, uh, uh, we uh, you know we've got time for a few questions tonight, but um, uh, then and then uh, we will be cutting off fairly quickly. So get your questions in now if you if you want to have anything answered swiftly, folks. Um, and the obvious question, the first one is, can I view this webinar again? Um, we are recording them now. I think I'll hand over to Rich actually at this point because you're going to be. Um, publishing this yourself as well, aren't you? Are you rerunning this yep. again yourself? Yeah, we're doing uh, we're doing the same webinar in uh, December. So Adobe's got a series of uh, e-seminars running uh, in November and December. Um, we've got one next week, which is with a lady called Tita Rice, who's a retoucher, um, and that's free. And then we have one in December. You can go to my blog, and all the details are, are there, but they will be pushed out. Uh, there's a question come through actually, which is uh, around the new photographer's package. When Lightroom 5 becomes LR6, will you get that included? Absolutely. You will get um, any updates that come through for Photoshop and for Lightroom come through, including dot releases and major releases. Cool. Thanks, Rich. Uh, question with regard to if you're shooting JPEG uh, and not RAW, can you use the Spider Cube? Well, yes, you can because, um, for instance, in Lightroom, anyway, you can certainly be working on your. JPEGs and TIFFs as well in there. It doesn't have to be in RAW, um, but uh, you know, I, I think probably speaking for all of us from this end, we probably would recommend for you to um, uh, to be using RAW though, and uh, uh, you do get such a lot more advantages with shooting in RAW. The, the actual range of what you can do with your images, but in particular, of course, in in Lightroom and using smart filters in Photoshop, you, the fact that you're, you're using metadata adjustments onto a master file, so you're not actually adjusting the master file, it's just the metadata that you're seeing adjusted there. It's more efficient for working and it's a great way of, uh, of being able to, as, as Richard showed, uh, pop back later on and uh, return to the original image and, and work in a different way from there. So, um, I think oh, in the background Raf's actually asking or popping up our poll, so uh, perhaps if uh, those of you out there could uh, Oh, yeah, you already are filling it in. Thank you, Kanye. So, Rich, are you staying up in Manchester tonight or not? I am, I am in Manchester tonight, and um, you know, everyone, uh, if you're a Canon uh, Pro member, you can come and visit me at the Manchester Canon Pro event. It's also available on my blog as well. And we had a very good day today talking Lightroom, Photoshop, talking Arctic photography, Aurora photography, talking lights with models and, and all sorts of stuff. That's so it's been a really, really, yeah, really great day, really engaging with those uh, with those guys. Cool. And uh, a few other events coming up shortly, eh? I think um, Yeah, you've you... got a lot coming up. Yeah, yeah indeed. Coming. We'll it's, exciting, you know, it's exciting that we've got things to a lot of things to talk about and lots of uh, workflow items. And, uh, yeah, it's uh, it's great. It's a great time to be uh, taking pictures. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, absolutely. And the uh, cloud's going down well, isn't it? So uh, yeah, people love it. Once 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 you go over, they love it. Love it. I have to say that photographer's bundle I hadn't appreciated was was that inexpensive. So. 
yes, it's a bargain. And that's a lock-in price as well. That's not just a one-off price. That's not an introductory price. It's the price moving forward. So uh, if you come out, then it's a different price. But if you stay in, then it's still the same price. Indeed. Yeah. Um, oh, we've got a question here. Please give us the results of the polls. I'm afraid I didn't actually see the results of the first poll, but the second one was um, there was a 95% uh, of people who are shooting in raw. So um, and for those of you who aren't, perhaps you should uh, come on over to the other side, as they say. <laughs> <laughs> Raw's the only way. The only way. Absolutely. Cool. Well, I think they're they're being kind to you tonight, Rich. In the, I think so. That's great. In, no, in the, the lack of uh, of questions there. It's, uh, <laughs> well, you can always reach out on Twitter. I mean, it's at Richard Curtis on Twitter. More than happy to uh, you know to to speak with you, engage with you there. Got my blog as well, and there's also Dover TV. So there's lots of things to um, to read and look at and to get familiar with. So and coming great. up in the not too distant, we'll both be at the Societies event in uh, in January, won't we? Yes. We're running a a joint theatre there, so that'll be uh, interesting if uh, anybody can come along to the SWPP convention in London. Yeah, in, and, uh, yeah, and come down and, and sign up before December because it's uh, it's free to sign up before December. Is it really? You're great. Yeah. I didn't realise that. Really does, oh, yeah. Lovely people at the societies. Absolutely, absolutely. Cool. Great. Well, well, thank you very much, Richard, for uh, your time tonight. I know you've had a long day, so I really appreciate you uh, you coming on and uh, and and uh, giving us the the fruits or some of the fruits of your your wisdom. Obviously, uh, crammed you into a, a short amount of time tonight, but um, I, I once again learnt lots in there. So great to to have you on board. No, you're absolutely welcome. That's great. And uh, thanks to Raf as well for for running the boat over in Switzerland as well. And um, <laughs> thank you, <laughs> thank you guys. Uh, I think uh, we know the, the the questions we seem to have answered. They're satisfied. Their their thirst for knowledge tonight. So the, the, the we've got a lot of thank yous and, and so on coming in there. So thank you, thank you all to those of you at home, uh, and or wherever you may be. And I uh, hope it's been worthwhile for you. And uh, I think at this point, well, we'll just say. Thanks for your time and uh, good night from somewhere in the, the UK. And I'll good pass over to Rich to say that indeed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good night, and it's been great to speak to you all today. And uh, we look forward to seeing you very shortly. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, everybody. Good night. <laughs>